Welcome to Almost Here, Round the Corner of Future Technology Podcasts with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies poised to transform our lives for better or worse are the focus of this podcast. Almost Here means these technologies are now here and starting to be used, or just around the corner, from Bitcoin to artificial intelligence, 3D printing, blockchain, virtual reality, and more. Coming to Dallas, Texas, September 14th, 15th, and 16th, 2018, the Blockchain and Future Tech Expo. This is going to be a gigantic conference of over 5,000 people. We're going to be talking about blockchain and its applications. We're going to be talking about quantum computing, cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, and several other future technologies that are poised to and actually changing our lives as we speak. Here's why you should attend. As you may know, early adopters are the ones that investigated and profited from things like the gold rush in the 1800s, from the dot-com boom in the 1990s, from the internet boom in 2005, from the smartphone explosion in 2007, from the real estate boom that ended in 2008, and of course, from the Bitcoin boom that started in 2012. Early adopters act now. They don't wait till later. They go out west first in their covered wagons. They find the biggest gold nuggets. If you consider yourself an early adopter and you want to find the biggest nuggets, then you owe it to yourself to attend this upcoming conference. Blockchain is going to affect how we control and store our medical data, how we send money around the world, how we bank, and more. But artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and cybersecurity will play a pivotal role in our lives as well. And that's why our next event, September 14th to the 16th at the Dallas Convention Center, is going to have not only 5,000 plus attendees, but we'll showcase blockchain, AI, cybersecurity, quantum computing, and more. You want to get in on the coming gold rush of future tech and opportunity as an early adopter. Don't be left out. To register, go to bftexpo.com. That's blockchainfuturetechexpo.com. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Future Tech Podcast. This is your host, Juliette Lamar, and we have with us today... Brad Harrison. He is the founder and managing partner at Gout Ventures. Welcome, Brad. Thank you for joining us. Hey, great to be here. Thanks for having me. So why don't you give our audience a little bit of insight into what Gout Ventures is? Sure. So we are a early stage venture capital firm headquartered out of New York City. We invest across the United States. We specialize in hard to access founders coming out of the government intelligence and research communities to include the national labs. Um, We have strong relationships with MIT and Carnegie Mellon, and we spend most of our time focused on the areas of frontier tech, which includes AI, autonomy, robotics, drones, and some other interesting stuff, and then cybersecurity and enterprise SaaS. Uh, We originally... uh, formed the company in 2012. We've made 65 investments to date. Um, and uh, currently we're moving on to fund three. Wonderful. So give us a little insight into like the approach. You know, how, how are you approaching this industry and these businesses in a unique manner? Yeah. So, you know, I, I've been doing early stage venture since 99. And so I've seen a couple of things evolve in, in early stage. You know, n- number one is when I started, you know, there there was no category of like pre-seed or seed, right? It really was like friends and family. And then you went to professional VCs at the Series A and B. The emergence of the incubators, accelerators, and all of these programs have really made a much broader kind of category that's now known as seed, which is, you know, anywhere from the first check all the way up to, you know, almost $3 million rounds that we're seeing today. Um, You know, for us, we think the most exciting time to get involved is kind of the pre-seed seed. seed. Um, We like small teams, multiple founders, um, developing in-house proprietary technology that's going to be transformational in one of the areas that we focus on. Um, and, you know, at Scout, we try to have a very hands-on approach. We say there's four things that kill early stage companies, running out of capital, bad critical hire on the early team, 
that early investor, that anchor customer or partner. So we really try to find teams where um, we know that our network and our resources will, you know, help them avoid those four pitfalls and where we can be value add beyond our capital. So we spend a lot of time focused on um, helping our entrepreneurs uh, gain access to relationships that are going to, you know, lead to either revenue and or investment. Absolutely. So when you're so when you're saying that you're hands on, you know, are you coming to companies with kind of a blueprint for what steps they should follow, or do you sit down and have a lot of meetings and and tailor each blueprint to the company? Yeah, you know, I I think we tailor each blueprint to the company, and that's uh, you know, the first and most important thing for us to make an investment decision is really um, coachability and compatibility with the founding team. So we spend a lot of time over indexing on this, uh, primarily because early stage investing is a really, it's a long term endeavor. You know, even if you find a, a Google or an Uber, you know, you're talking about 10, 12 years before, you know, you, you see the liquidity in that a, event. So it's about finding a long term team that, you know, is going to be responsive to the way in which we can add value. And then after that, You know, what we do at Scout is if we need a team that we really like before we've ever invested, we actually make five or ten introductions to people in our network. Uh, That'll include other investors, commercial relationships, potentially, you know, an analyst at McKenzie who's, you know, deep in that technology sector, whatever it might be, um, to really kind of see, hey, does our assumptions about the opportunity and more importantly, does our network, you know, is it going to be valuable to that? So we actually demonstrate to the entrepreneur from the very beginning before we've written a check kind of the power of the scout network. And, you know, what we like about that is, you know, if it, if it doesn't turn into an investment, you know, the entrepreneur goes away and hopefully they have a couple of relationships that they didn't have before. So reputationally, you know, they say, well, you know, the scout team, what a good bunch of people, you know, they made some introductions even though they didn't invest. If we do decide to write a check, then hopefully they've been able to see in comparison to some of the other investors out there, you know, our collaborative approach, the value of our relationships and all of that. So it's a a very beneficial kind of next step. Uh, And ultimately, you know, we want to make sure that we're being deployed the right way to help the company. And what we see a lot of times in all these companies is there's a pattern. You know, they need a lot of help at the beginning where they're figuring out product market fit, they're making critical hires, they're putting their round together, and then they might spend six months kind of working on the product, doing dev, doing whatever, to get some beta customers, getting feedback. And then they go to ramp up sales, and they need help. How do I build my sales team? How do I bring this out? Do this, do that. And so what we find is that we're able to help them kind of understand the flow and the pattern of, of what a healthy matriculation looks like for their company based on where they should be delivering product and revenue and all of that. Um, And so it's super exciting. Yeah. And it sounds like a really positive work environment, you know, like you, you're not too overbearing. You're more of a a partnership. Yeah. That's, that's, we don't, you know, we don't make them create a weird report, you know, it's, it's all about like, this is the objective. We want to build the best company possible. It's going to be peaks and valleys. Some things are going to go really well. Some things are going to go bad. You know, use us um, to help you think through decisions because we have uh, collectively, you know, decades of years of experience in, in building and operating companies, right? Even Even Scout in its essence, you know, was an entrepreneurial investment you know, was an entrepreneurial endeavor that I started, right? So I mm-hmm. think they relate to that. Um, and that commonality helps earn trust. And we hope that, you know, we can deliver what we need. Yeah. So let's let's go into a little bit about your background then as the founder and, you know, what motivates you and, and what is your background in this industry a little bit? 
Yeah, so um, my background, I'm a, I'm a little non-traditional in adventure. So I went to West Point undergrad, uh, studied theoretical economics. Then I spent five years as an airborne ranger. Um, and then when I got out of the military, I went to grad school at MIT Sloan during the first dot-com bubble um, and started investing um, on behalf originally of a gentleman named Dick Parsons, who was chairman of AOL Time Warner and Citigroup, who's a, a mentor of mine. Um, actually, we, we just shot some really cool video with Dick um, that we split into 10 lessons from Dick Parsons on, you know, kind of building companies. Um, but, you know, really started doing early stage um, worked at a small fund called um, ITU Ventures, which was money out of the founder of Global Crossing. Started doing deals uh, along the way, invested in my friend Hemet Tanasia, who's now a, a partner at General Catalyst. And so have kind of been in the industry for a really long time and spent time at AOL Time Warner in business affairs and development, spent some time working for Ted Leonsis, the vice chairman, really learned a lot about, you know, the corporate side of the world and then how that interacts with when they go to acquire smaller companies, when you're, you know, building out strategy, product market fit, all of the things that, you know, we have experience with that we now use on the early stage. Um, and then I worked at a startup called When You, grew that to $100 million, got ready to filed for an IPO and got hit with privacy concerns, kind of web privacy concerns. So totally understand what Zuck's going through right now. Um, <laughs> and then, and then uh, you know, basically went out on my own in 2006 as kind of a venture advisor. So I would advise early stage CEOs. I would advise funds that were not in New York about the opportunity of the New York ecosystem. And then I helped the con- bunch of companies from Silicon Valley in New York to Tel Aviv on kind of business affairs and development. And that really morphed into, um, you know, an interesting kind of, you know, the market blew up in 2008. And when we came out of that, Todd Dagris, who's the founder of Spark Capital, and I was his teaching assistant, Todd said, you know, you don't need a fund to start building your track record, start writing checks. And so I started writing my first checks. I got some money from my dad. I got some money from a West Point buddy. We pooled our money. We we started to get some more momentum. And then in 2011, we turned that into Fund One. 2012, we closed that. We did a follow-on uh, fund for one called One A. Um, and then we did our second fund in uh, 2014 called Fund Two. Uh, first fund was about four and a half million, so not very big. With a two million follow-on fund, uh, two was about eleven million, and fund three is fifty million. And that's kind of how we got here. Wow, quite a quite a long resume and lots of different experience, which is wonderful when you're pulling from from that for these smaller companies that are coming up. Yeah, I I think you know the the road less traveled. You know, when I was getting out of the military, I had all these people in banking, and, you know, I thought I wanted to go be an investment banker. And at the end of the day, I think I've always been an entrepreneur, and I like building companies. I like interacting with teams. I like solving the challenges that, you know, companies have when they're at the, the the small level. You know, we have companies that, you know, we were the first check-in that we've sold for $150 million. We have companies that we were the first check-in that are doing, you know, 20 to $40 million in revenue and two, 300 employees. And, you know, it feels good to have been part of the, the foundational steps, right? You know, I have a, I have a mm-hmm. seven-year-old and a nine-year-old. And, you know, a lot of times... Uh, it's all about giving them the foundational skills so that they can make good decisions on their own, right? And I think a lot of times being an adventure investor is no different, right? We like, we we have a lot of experience. We kind of try to gently nudge our entrepreneurs in the right direction and give them the right counsel and give them access to, you know, 
our other entrepreneurs so that they don't waste time, you know, learning hard lessons on their own that can be avoided through collaboration. Exactly. And you're, you're really, I mean, offering them so much. So getting back to some of those success stories, uh, are there any that you can share um, that you're very proud of, little companies that have, that have grown and what they're about? Yeah, I, I'll give you a, I'll give you two different ones. The first one is a company called the Olapic that I found when I was mentoring at Columbia University. Um, three Spanish entrepreneurs that you know, for whatever reason, I just love their their interaction. Right, like I liked the way they interacted with me. I liked the way they interacted with one another. And it just felt like there was something special in that dynamic. Ironically, their their original use case scenario for their technology was to be a way to aggregate wedding photos from all your different hmm. guests across all the different social media channels into one place. And I thought the wedding space, and I still do, like I hate the wedding space. Um, <laughs> you know, I know the I know the founders of the Knot, um, and you know, I know how tough that business is. But, you know, I wrote them their first $15,000 check at a coffee shop in Tribeca after they won the Columbia Business Plan competition, and they needed fifteen grand um, to, you know, be eligible to get the $25,000 check from Columbia. Um, and, you know, that was one of my very first checks. Uh, we participated in all the subsequent rounds, and then in 2016, they were acquired by a public company named Monotype for $149 million. So really great story. Um, was really kind of happy um, with everything about the way that deal happened. Um, there's another company uh, called Bespoke Post, which has a men's box of awesomeness that is absolutely exactly what it sounds like. It's a, a curated uh, men's site that has both a subscription box and a store and really educates uh, men the ages, you know, 20 to 45 on, you know, key areas that men need help. You know, these are the wine glasses you need. This is the razor. You know, these are the cufflinks. These are you know, really kind of everyday critical essential items for like the more, you know, advanced um, kind of young man of the future. And their box of awesomeness is awesome. You know, we met mm-hmm. them. They were pivoting from another business. Um, we convinced them to take our money and let us lead the round, join the board. And every quarter we would meet with the founders, we would map out the plan, and their revenue growth has just been amazing. Um, And we're two of the nicest guys I've I've ever met. You know, honest, hardworking, diligent, good style, um, and they've built a really special business. I mean, it sounds like, it sounds, I can hear that you're, you know, you really are invested not just financially, but emotionally and and your heart is in these businesses because you really want them to succeed. It's not just a, a bet, really, you know. And 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 I hate being wrong. And when I say that, you know, it's one part like, say, we invested in something that's not a good idea, right? Like, I, I and that's not what I, I really get, you know, what gets me emotional. I think, you know, it's the fact that every time I walk in their office, the Olympic team or the bespoke team, like I feel like those guys love me, right? Because I was there Mm -hmm. when nobody else was there. We mapped out a plan and it worked, right? Like it worked. Um, And that's a really, really rewarding feeling. Now, on the same token, there's the entrepreneurs you have the same hopes for when you get started. And then as it turns out, You know, they don't take your advice and they don't have the same growth and they don't have the same outcome. And that's really, really upsetting. You know, very, I'll use the kid analogy again, right? Like when your kids are loving and I love you, daddy, it's great. When your kid is like, I hate you, daddy, you know, (laughs) and I'm not saying it gets to that point with the entrepreneurs, but, you know, these are young 
very talented, very bright, gifted people, and sometimes they don't know how to listen to advice. Um, or Absolutely, they just, strong-headed. <laughs> or they just think they know better. And so for us, you know, our job, our our fiduciary responsibility as investors is integrity, accountability, you know, all of these things. This is the stuff that, like, we bring to the table. Um, and, you know, it's very easy for a young entrepreneur in Silicon Valley that has all these people running around telling them how great they are to pick their investor by whoever writes the biggest check at the highest valuation. But I would argue that's not what adds the most value. Um, and, you know, we want to be one of the people that add the most value. Exactly. It's quality over quantity. Yes, yeah, 100%. So what are some of the the pitfalls that you see over and over again for these young seed companies that they, that they fall into? Um, so, you know, a couple of the ones, and, and we kind of touched on this, but, you know, not my, managing your cash, right, mm-hmm. which is, you know, they didn't want to sell the equity or they couldn't raise the capital, so they undercapitalized the company and they're always running out of cash. So that's number one. Number two, bad critical hire on the early team. If you are, you know, building a company and you hire your first, you know, lead developer and that lead developer turns out to be a dud, you know, in some cases that's a catastrophic mistake, right? Because if you can't get that product um, to where you can sell it and get it to customers, like it's going to be a real problem. So, you know, the the critical hires, the same thing applies for your first sales hire and your first marketing hire. Um, And we often, um, with our companies, will actually help interview on the sales side, again, to kind of give our experience um, Mm -hmm. and just give another opinion. So I think that's part of it. Um, You know, the next one, a bad early investor, so, you know, Sometimes in some of these off markets, you get, um, you know, entrepreneurs that get money from people that are either not experienced venture investors, so dumb money, um, or, you know, my favorite is when we see an investor who, like, was a real estate investor and put some real estate, like, coupon clause into their friends and family round. Like, so bad early investor can mess them up. Um, and then the last one and one that we're, we're very uh, aware of is a bad anchor customer or partner. So I, I feel really bad, but, you know, I can't tell you how many entrepreneurs have come in and said, Brad, it's great. We just met with IBM Watson, and they're going to give us a development contract, and they're going to, you know, put up a million dollars, and then we're going to go into this program. And, you know, we don't need to raise more money. It's all great. Um, <clears throat> and in actuality, like, then the team that they were talking to gets juggled and their sponsor leaves and, you know, they wind up spending uh, a year looking at an LOI from some major corporation that they never enact and it, it winds up eating up all their resources because they're trying to please a big, big customer that, you know, is probably um, – not going to come through. Uh, Ironically, you know, everybody thinks it's better to start with a really, really big customer. But in some, first off, it's good just to get your first customer. So we always Mm -hmm. say is like, get your first customer. Then you worry about, you know, being picky about customers. But get your first customer and make them one that will allow you to evolve your product and develop with you know, we're a company in our portfolio, and we were we were just joking. They just sold. They just signed a new customer for a, an eight hundred and sixty thousand dollar annual contract, like a real contract. When we started that business, the first ten customers paid five thousand dollars. Wow! Right? So look at what we were able to do. Now those customers, which you know are somewhat different, different sector, different. But those customers inform a lot of the product development and in decisions that we then use 
that have created the value that now allow us to sell it. So having the right early customers can be one of the most valuable things because you learn and you evolve and you adapt and you redo the programs and you get everything where it needs to go, super valuable. You sit there and you, you know, jump back and forth for some huge company and a lot of times you don't have the resources because you're a small company. So, you know, you got to go through compliance. Well, you don't have a compliance person. So, like, that sucks up the CEO or the CTO's bandwidth. So, you know, a lot of what we want to do um, is, uh, you know, try to eliminate that. Exactly. Eliminate that back and forth. Make things a little more easy. And, and you know, when you're when you're in the early stages, you just want it so bad. You know, you want to succeed so bad and, and that big company might look like the best way to do that. But you're right. You have to refocus your attention, refocus your attention. Yeah. So how can people, you know, get involved if they have a small seed company and they, they want to pitch it to you? What's the best way? I mean, they can email me, Brad at Squad Ventures, um, with, with the caveat that, you know, we see 20 deals a day. So, you know, we, we look at everything, um, you know, and just bear with us. It, it, it takes us some time to process them. But, you know, I would say out of, you know, out of every 20 deals we see a day, probably five of them are interesting. Three of them are probably, um, you know, on target with what we would invest in and, out of that, you know, a handful get moved to in-person meetings and then, you know, ultimately, whatever, out of, out of that bucket, out of every hundred we look at, maybe we write one or two checks. So, not great odds, but not, not terrible. <laughs> well, I mean, we want to say not great odds, but, you know, we... Maybe that's because we have a really good pipeline. Um, but I also think it's really hard to create, you know, transformational technology with core DNA being, you know, something proprietary with the right team, with the right market up. Like, it's hard, right? This is not an easy mm-hmm. business. And a lot of times we meet great entrepreneurs with an interesting not venture business, like a great lifestyle business, like absolutely you should go do that. You and your family can make, you know, a quarter of a million or, you know, anywhere from a quarter of a million to a million dollars a year at scale. You know, you'll be able to live on the beach. You can sell, you know, your your surfboards or whatever you're selling off of your site. You know, that's great, just not a venture business. So, you know, there's stuff that we have to pass on because, um, you know, we just, um, you know, we just have to be able to be sensitive to, you know, writing the check isn't the hard part. It's being able to get the the winners, right, and and get the Mm -hmm. money out. And, you know, we talked about how long that takes and there's follow-on investors and you got to manage for dilution and are you adding enough value to the company? You know, it's a, a very, very hard, long journey, um, but it's the most, like I would, there's nothing else in the world I'd rather be doing. Absolutely. If you go to your website, uh, scoutventures.com, they can learn a lot more about, about your company and what you're doing, and that's a really good place to connect to you. Is that correct? Yeah, that's probably the best. You know, I'm on I'm on Twitter at Brad Harrison one um, and try to, you know, put some interesting stuff out there. And I, we have a blog, um, which you can get to through Scout Ventures. And then also I have a blog uh, called Mayor Brad. Um, and there's things like, you know, if you go there and you search for something called the dreaded call, you know, it's just a story of an entrepreneur that, you know, got to the point where he wasn't going to make it, right? And he, you know, called and cried and, you know, we worked through all of the hard things. And, you know, what I what I love about what we've built with our community of entrepreneurs is, you know, we're the first text or phone call for all the good stuff, but also all the bad stuff, right? And, mm-hmm. you know, we take that as a really good um, vote of confidence that our opinion and our, our counsel is the one that they need in the in the hardest 
darkest hours. And I think, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, founders that are forged by, you know, adversity and all of these things. And whether that was military service or uh, wherever they come from, a lot of the reason that's put our mantra is that, like, that's where me and my partner Wes come from, right? He was a naval aviator, went to Annapolis, went to Darden, you know, was a leadership professor, was on admissions at, at the Naval Academy, understanding how to evaluate talent and then how to mentor them into good leaders. You know, we, we often say the, the you know, the mission of both of our academies is to develop, you know, men and women of character who are going to live a lifetime of service, right? And that's in service of their family, in service of the military, in service of their company. Um, and a lot of that is about values and shared values and understanding, like, we always would like to do the harder right over the easier wrong. Um, and we know that there's a lot of things that happen in building companies that are difficult. And we want to make sure that we use that advice to help our companies do the right thing. Absolutely. Well, Brad, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your knowledge and wisdom with us today. It's been a true pleasure. Yeah, it was great. So glad uh, I could take the time and hopefully, um, you know, it's, uh, useful to anybody that listens. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Brad. That was Brad Harrison. He's the founder and managing partner at Scout Ventures. This has been Juliet Lamar with Future Tech Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. Coming to Dallas, Texas, September 14th, 15th, and 16th, 2018, the Blockchain and Future Tech Expo. This is going to be a gigantic conference of over 5,000 people. We're going to be talking about blockchain and its applications. We're going to be talking about quantum computing, cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, and several other future technologies that are poised to and actually changing our lives as we speak. Here's why you should attend. As you may know, early adopters are the ones that investigated and profited from things like the gold rush in the 1800s, from the dot-com boom in the 1990s, from the internet boom in 2005, from the smartphone explosion in 2007, from the real estate boom that ended in 2008, and of course, from the Bitcoin boom that started in 2012. Early adopters act now. They don't wait till later. They go out west first in their covered wagons. They find the biggest gold nuggets. If you consider yourself an early adopter and you want to find the biggest nuggets, then you owe it to yourself to attend this upcoming conference. Blockchain is going to affect how we control and store our medical data, how we send money around the world, how we bank, and more. But artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and cybersecurity will play a pivotal role in our lives as well. And that's why our next event, September 14th to the 16th at the Dallas Convention Center, is going to have not only 5,000 plus attendees, but will showcase blockchain, AI, cybersecurity, quantum computing, and more. You want to get in on the coming gold rush of future tech and opportunity as an early adopter. Don't be left out. To register, go to bftexpo.com. That's blockchainfuturetechexpo.com. Thank you. You have been listening to Almost Here, Around the Corner Future Technology Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Subscribe to this podcast, post a review, to discover more future technologies that are poised to transform our lives for better or worse, such as Bitcoin, artificial intelligence, 3D printing, blockchain, virtual reality, and more.